Welcome to a special episode of The Projection Booth. I am your host, Mike White. Now, if you listened to our recent Ego Fest episode, you'll know that I was up in Toronto over Labor Day weekend and hosting a few panels. Those were Q&As where I was sitting next to a celebrity and asking them questions, taking questions from the audience. It was a really good time. And fortunately, our good friend Stuart Feedback Andrews of Cinephobia Radio and formerly of Rue Morgue Radio, he captured all of those interviews. Now, this one that we're about to play with Orlando Jones, I have to say that it was not recorded that well, and that is completely my fault. Few things going on with it. Uh, the recorder was my mini recorder, not the best quality in the world. Also, for some reason, I was not hearing myself in the monitor at all, so I was speaking into the microphone. You might even be able to hear somebody encourage me to speak closer into the mic, and that pretty much overmodulated my voice totally. But that said, I think think that it still holds up. Mr. Jones sounds fantastic, very animated, very fun. There are clips of him out on YouTube with this. There's some good photos that go along with this whole thing. Orlando Jones sitting in my lap was not something that I expected to have happen that weekend. So let's go ahead and play this interview with Orlando Jones from Fan Expo 2015. All right, folks, good news. I'm very happy to say that Orlando Jones is here. I almost said Orlando Bloom. Oh, my God. That would be so bad. Uh, just so you know, I'm Mike White. I'm one of the hosts of the Projection of the Podcast out of Detroit. And uh, this is my first time doing a big Q&A here at Fan Expo, so please bear with me. But, yeah, I'm very happy to finally meet and introduce Orlando Jones. <laughs> came out, you said I was supposed to sit on your left or your lap. I heard lap. Oh, I'm sorry. That works. That works for me. Why do I feel like a hand puppet all of a sudden? Right here? I'm sorry. Yeah, something's not right. I'll wash that later. Please. All right. Please. It's corrosive. <laughs> Mr. Jones, very nice to meet you. Thank you very much for uh, having me. Nice to meet you. Thanks for coming out. Thank you. I want to know, I usually ask people how they got their start in the business. I hear that you originally weren't going to be in show business. You were more of a basketball player. Uh, that that is, that is pretty much true, actually. Uh, I, I announced to my, my professional sports male family that I was going to Hollywood to become an actor. And um, they called an intervention. <laughs> um, I wound up over at my grandmama's house, <laughs> and uh, my uncle walks in, and he says, Oh, uh, <clears throat> your daddy say you're going out to California, so you want to be an actor. Mm -hmm. That's what your daddy say. Is there something you want to tell us about what's going on with you right now? <laughs> So I, after being called gay uh, by my uncles and refusing to answer on the grounds that some of my favorite people are gay, so what difference does that make? Mm -hmm. So we had our fight, and, uh, and they released me to California, and uh, since then I have been an echo. But not only an actor, a writer as well. My first job was writing, yes. Yeah. I, was, uh, I was, gosh, a different world. Like, I'm old. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> there was a show, and th this is how weird like life is, right? So, um, they tell I'm from South Carolina, from the deep south, and I can hear from um, my accent. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Well, if you want me to sound like I really sound, I can do that for you. <laughs> yeah, your mic isn't. No. You're not. You got to lean into the like. <laughs> don't be ashamed. Put your mouth on it. It's just a mic. You ain't got to be all homophobic about it. Go ahead. Just, you got, there you go. Yes. Good deal. That's right. Cup of Jets, oh, thank you. See, now, listen, huh? listen. This is a family oh. show. Okay, I'm not going to hell for you. I'm not doing it. <laughs> um, 
Uh, where were we in this wild ride? Where were we? You're talking about writing. Um, so, uh, I guess, I came from the South, so I didn't really know anybody in Hollywood. I didn't have that experience. In a different world was this wildly successful show. It was on after Cosby, and so, suddenly I, I got thrust into this thing that it's the biggest show in television. It's the biggest night in television history. So, Thursday, night, NBC. Thursday night, NBC. Imagine this type of madness. 40 million people watching the same channel for four hours. <laughs> Could you imagine like sitting in front of a TV for four hours? <laughs> like people did this. And they watched, uh, you know, Cosby, A Different World, Cheers, Wings, L.A. Law, NBC Nightly News, and that led you into a Saturday Night Live, and that sort of franchise was sort of what built NBC. So that was my first job in the business as a writer. Nice. And wrote on that show, uh, co-wrote the pilot of Martin with John Bowman, did the Sinbad show as a producer, so produced a couple hundred episodes, uh, a few hundred episodes of television, left and went to um, New York to launch FX, which at the time was a new network, and we were experimenting with this thing called reality TV. <laughs> and uh, yes, yes, it was, it was very exciting. Uh, and me and Tom Bergeron, who I think is on Dancing with the Stars, and Jeff Probst from Survivor, and Phil Kogan from Amazing Race, were all a part of this crazy experiment called reality television. And uh, left there, and I went to Mad TV as a performer for the first time and then from Mad TV since I've been mostly in movies and done some television a little bit since Mad uh, but you know Sleepy Hollow and what like that's that's my that's the snapshot of my life I'm sorry to bore you all I'm bothered <laughs> apologize <laughs> When it came to Mad TV, you were kind of in a different position than a lot of your castmates, I understand, because you were doing the writing and the... Yes. It was, it was a horrible position to be in. I don't recommend it. Imagine the following. So I'm the only cast member that's on the writing staff. Mm -hmm. So when you go in the writing room, you hear all the writers complain about the actors. <laughs> <laughs> this actor sucks. How come he didn't say the line like I told him to? Why does she make that face? Like all the writers do is trash the actors, right? So you go into the actor's room and all we do is go, what is this garbage? Who wrote this stupidity? <laughs> so I'm sitting in a conversation where I hear everything that everybody says bad about each other and I'm trying to be like chocolate Switzerland, you know? <laughs> So that was uh, it was a tough experience, but um, it was a fun experience, I think, because um, you know you get to be a part of shaping something that was a part of my childhood. Like I'm a nerd. I read Mad Magazine. Like somebody told me I was going to get a chance to be on Mad TV. I was like, oh, <laughs> don't stop, get it, get it, don't stop. <laughs> it was all that popping, ain't no stopping. Dre got some ladies from the city of Compton to serve me. Anyway, uh, my point is. It was an exciting time, so uh, I kind of remain, I think, very much that person because I think uh, I started off as a fan, and, and I'm still a fan. Right. Yeah. What were some of your favorite uh, skits that you were either in or penned? Oh, goodness. I'll tell you the fun ones. So I got in trouble once with Steven Spielberg. This was awesome. <laughs> So, listen, it's Mad Magazine. You're supposed to do satirical comedy. You might occasionally offend, offend somebody. I don't like offend people. But I don't give offense. You take offense. You don't include me in the decision-making process. You see how it works? <laughs> so I write this sketch that is my parents arguing in a car. Right. And my father will not stop and ask for directions. He just does not care. Yeah. And my mother has it all mapped out, and she's explaining to this Nova monkey that he needs to make a left turn, but he knows a shortcut. And I'm in the back seat. I wrote that sketch with Oscar Schindler and his wife. The sketch was called Schindler's Lost. <laughs> the story of a man with a sense of history but no sense of direction. Now, I thought that was funny. And to be fair, Fox greenlit it, everybody approved, we shot the sketch. And then somebody called Steven Spielberg and said, this is anti-Semitic. And all of a sudden, everything blew up. So I get a phone call, and all I hear is... And he's like, Orlando, this is Quincy Jones. I'm in a helicopter with Steven Spielberg. What the hell did you do? <laughs> So uh, 
that was one of my favorite sketches just because I got uh, Quincy Jones to ask me from a helicopter what, what the hell I did. <laughs> And uh, once I explained that it's my parents in a car and it was just a sketch, they were like, that's funny, that's funny. We can't do that. That, that can't happen. So that sketch got shot down. Um, uh, I got cussed out by Bill Cosby once. That was hilarious. Yep. I got called into the office at William Morris because I'd done this sketch called Cosby's, Cosby's Crib. Okay. And in the sketch, uh, I make Bill Cosby a drug dealer. Um, and and he's, what? He's selling crack. What do you want from me? It was funny. Come on, Bill Cosby with the crack voice. I. <laughs> nice foreshadowing is right. Bah, bah. So, I do the sketch, and in the sketch, I tell Theo that he should be hustling like a mother father. <laughs> In the street, making the moolah. <laughs> and it was really making fun of the fact that Bill Cosby, you know, had, you know, one of the most successful sitcoms in, in television history, yet he was being criticized at the same time for being not black enough. And I just thought that was so weird. Like, how can you be not black enough? Like, is, <laughs> is there a panel that people go, look, he black, he black, but... <laughs> This Colin Powell, I can't be so sure. I just can't be so sure. Like, what kind of committee decides who's Italian enough or black enough or Irish enough? It just seemed ridiculous. So that's what the sketch was about for me. It was about Bill having to do something so ridiculous uh, to get people to notice the fact that he had done something spectacular, which was he'd created a family sitcom that was absent of color. And then he turns out to be a horrible human being. Like, who, who knows? It, like, life is weird, right? I mean, life is weird in that way. So I was doing that show and getting cussed out by Bill. They called me into William Morris, and he said, Are you making fun of me or the media? And I thought, is this a trick question? Or? I'm making fun of the media. And there's like a five-minute pause where no one says anything, and he goes, Okay. And they basically escorted me out of the room. And, and that was me getting cussed out by Bill Cosby. That was, that was a good one. So those are some of my favorites. How did being on <laughs> Mad TV pro, um, kind of prepare you for some of the stuff that was going to come afterwards? I mean, after that, you kind of, you know, you're a pitch man. Do you still get people to come up to you and uh, tell you up yours? Oh, yeah. People start, you know, shove stuff up my butt all day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> up yours. Like, really? Like, it's 20 years ago. That's out of context for me. I'm walking with my daughter. Up yours. My daughter's like, why are they saying up yours to you, daddy? I'm like, it's a long story. It's hard for me to explain. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate fortunate in that, you know, anytime I'm, I'm having a, what I think is a bad day, mm -hmm. somebody invariably walks up to me and says something about something I did at some point in my life that made them smile. Right. What were some of the favorite roles that you've been in? Oh, I hate everything I've ever done. Yeah. <laughs> yes, equally, I think I am horrible. <laughs> That's why it's so fun when somebody's like, you suck. I'm like, I know, right? <laughs> agree with you. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, you know, I just, it's uncomfortable. Yeah. You ever heard the sound of your voice recorded? Yes. Doesn't it sound weird? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So that is still weird to me. Mm -hmm. I, I'm never, I don't know if I'll ever be comfortable watching right. and seeing me. I always feel like something's wrong with my face. <laughs> I think one of my favorite turns of yours was when you were Bobby Seal in the Chicago 8. Oh, wow. Oh, somebody did their homework, huh? <laughs> um, uh, okay, yes. Um, that was a fun role. It, it really was. Um, does anybody know who Bobby Seal is? No? Bobby Seal. <laughs> so, all right, there's these dudes that were called the Black Panthers. Uh, and there was a time in this country when, you know, people weren't acting right. Wait, I shouldn't say that. That's time, that time is still here. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of not act right going on. Scratch that. Start over. Um, anyway, Bobby Seale was a really interesting character. And, uh, 
you know, he's a guy that's had a really interesting life. You know, he's gone from sort of fighting for human rights and civil rights to selling barbecue sauce. Uh, but there's a historic trial wherein a lot of the things that we fight about today uh, was called the Chicago 8, and Bobby Seale was a huge part of that trial and the, the fight for what we call our, our civil liberties. And so I got a chance to play that character, and it was, you know, it was fun, you know? Not, yeah, yeah. not what I usually get, so I'm, ex- I'm surprised. The chemistry between you and uh, Philip Baker Hall was... Yeah. Yes. Terrific. Philip Baker Hall. I, the first movie I did with him was Magnolia, and I got cut out of the movie. Oh. <laughs> I wonder what yeah. happened with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, I shot this, all this stuff. I shot for like two months. And then I got a phone call while sitting in an interview with Vanity Fair, and they were like, uh, is this Orlando? I'm like, yeah. yeah. Uh, Paul Thomas Anderson wants to talk to you. Hi, Orlando, it's Paul. The movie's four hours long, and it needs to be three hours and 15 minutes, so we're going to cut that entire storyline. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God. I felt like I, felt like I was like Miss Pac-Man. I went, wonk, 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 wonk. Like, <laughs> I died all at once. But, uh, you know, I got to work with Philip Baker Hall a second time in Chicago. It's so fun. Yeah. I want to open up to folks for a little bit here. Let's take some questions. Uh, who's got a question for Orlando here? Do you still drink 7-Up? All the time. I bathe in it. Um, I took a bath in it this morning. No, seriously. Yeah, well, I, what I like to do is I like to heat it up to like 80 degrees. I mix it with some water. I drop in some rose petals so I make my skin feel all tingly. Yeah. Yes. And while I'm sitting there, I normally wouldn't tell this to anybody, but while I'm sitting there, I scoop some out and... <laughs> That's real talk. Where are you with your sports career? Oh, wow. Um, well, um, as you know, Clifford Franklin um, is the only one catching it because he's the only one coming down with it. I think we all know that. Um, uh, my sports career is non-existent. Um, <laughs> I am too old. <laughs> I, I look, I, I still love to go play basketball, so it's still a lot of fun, and uh, go out and play with the guys. I will tell you a fun story, though. The NBA has an entertainment league, and all the actors play in the entertainment league. Now, I played at Florida State, so I know a little bit about basketball, but not a lot. But you don't have to be a genius to realize that David Arquette does not need to guard Frankie Nunez <laughs> at the half-court line. Literally, with a headband, socks pulled up over his knees, 70 short shorts, and he's like this. Come on, baby! Come on! And Frankie Nunez is like dribbling the ball like this. And the rest of the team is standing underneath the basket. And generally, Kevin Hart is standing right outside going, Hey, man, come on now, come on! Get the game going! Forget Frankie Nunez! Kevin Hart is here! So that, that, that's where my sports career is. And I consider that the rock bottom, sir. That is the rock bottom. <laughs> so you did Gishmas last year. And I was just wondering, what was your favorite item to do? Oh, wow. Um, the jet... The, oh, hold on. Do, uh, does everybody know what Gishwish is? Woo! Yes. So, okay, so Gishwiz, the greatest international scavenger hunt the world has ever seen. So it's put on by uh, my friend and colleague, Misha Collins, who's on a show called Supernatural. Huh? That's right, girlfriend, you know what I'm talking about. Don't make my inner black girl, Olandra, pop out and have a conversation up in here. Okay, boo boo. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, I, uh, I I love the scavenger hunt. He does it for charity. He he obviously raises money and helps people. I mean, Misha's a you know he's a really wonderful guy with a, a huge heart. And uh, I participated last year. There was a jet pilot thing where you had to have a fighter pilot do a roll and and have a camera on you and then he held up your name. So the mere fact that I was going to get somebody that they gave a fighter jet to do a roll with my name on it, that's nerd heaven right there, okay? I was having nerdgasms all day long. So I got that and that's on my screensaver. That gif is what I look at. Like, mm, I'm like, look out for 
the hell up my name? <laughs> and that's a baby jump, jump, get it, get it, jump, jump. I'm just saying. <laughs> that's kind of hot. Um, so, Gish was, I would like to, I wanted to do it this year, but instead, y'all sent me ponies. Like, I have never gotten more My Little Ponies. <laughs> Misha Collins made this line item that said that me and William Shatner, who have been in a Twitter beef now for, I think, two years, I'm fighting with an 80-year-old man on Twitter. You see how pathetic I am? It's pathetic. But there was a My Little Pony mashup of me and Shatner, so you had to make one and then send it to me. So during Gishwiz, I think I got like 3,000 My Little Ponies with my face morphed in like... Looking like donkey. <laughs> like every messed up pony shot from every Photoshop. Y'all some of the worst Photoshoppers. Sweet Jesus, what was that? So that was, uh, that was Gishwiz. Thank you for uh, reminding me of my madness. Mm, you. Anybody? Anybody else? Mademoiselle? Hi, uh, my name is Eliza. Hi, Eliza Orlando. Nice to meet you. <laughs> right, right. My question is actually about double take. Okay. This is one of my favorite films ever. Like, it's absolutely hilarious. <laughs> did you get a little Pomeranian after that? Like, did you get a little white Pomeranian after that? My parents were trinity. They killed me. <laughs> you're right. You're, I don't know what I was thinking. Because your mama told me twice, don't tell that girl to get no damn Pomeranian. I was like, calm down, stop yelling at me, all right? You remember the conversation, you know. Anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, so, I just wanted to know what it was, what it was like working with Eddie Griffin. Oh. And also... Okay. Do you like Schlitz Malt Liquor? First of all, everybody likes Schlitz Malt Liquor. <laughs> Schlitz Malt Liquor is delicious. Schlitz Malt Liquor. I think you actually have to say it like that. <laughs> By the way, the, you'll appreciate this. My uncles, who I was telling you about earlier, that's who says Schlitz Malt Liquor like that. No way. No Schlitz Malt Liquor. No Schlitz Malt Liquor. Successful business, and you ain't got no slam mouth like you ain't rubbing them, you ain't keeping it raw. That's my drunk uncle, that's what that is. Yeah, so Eddie Griffin is a wild man. If anybody knows Eddie Griffin, um, I think Eddie Griffin was doing a movie several years ago where he wrecked like four million dollars in cars. <laughs> Because he was supposed to be racing like a Ferrari, and every time they gave him one, he would just wreck it and get out and laugh. <laughs> so that's what it's like working with Eddie Griffin. <laughs> like in the middle of the take, Eddie will decide he just wants to say something totally different. So that's just Eddie, and you just have to kind of go with it. So it, I actually love Eddie, and I think it's a lot of fun, but the director was about to have a heart attack. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They were running up to us in between takes, and they would have the script in their hand, and they would be pointing at it, like trying to read what they wrote and talk to Eddie. So just imagine this is all you see all day long. Cut! Hey! Huh. Uh, it, say, it say here on the paper, it say here, you're supposed to say uh, two D cups, and he's supposed to say what time is it. I, don't, I didn't see nothing you said on the paper. There's nothing here. Nothing uh, is on this paper. <laughs> and they would literally do this over and over again. <laughs> like that all day long, somebody ran in and pointed, and Eddie was like, mm hmm, yes, indeed, he feed the needy. <laughs> I don't even care. I don't even care. <laughs> so that's what Eddie would do, and then they would tell me to talk to Eddie, and I would say, can we just do one take where we say all the lines? And he was like, man, we ain't saying none of that food in there. <laughs> <laughs> you say what you say, I say what I say. <laughs> so uh, that was uh, that was the escapades of Double Take. So I would do it again. <laughs> I kept waiting for a twist in that movie where you and he were actually the same character. Like, thank you. Time. Yes. Yeah. You you clearly are a better writer than him, <laughs> than the one I had <laughs> access to at the time. <laughs> you know, it's it's a it was a fun one. So good. Yeah. Another question? Yes, sir. Um, obviously, I'm going to ask you this. Um, I remember watching Dinner for Five, and John Favreau said he didn't have a great time doing the replacement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you? I had a ball, but I'm crazy. <laughs> So he asked uh, during the replacements, uh, while the filming of the replacements, John Favreau had commented that he didn't have a good time. I, I had an awesome time. It was a tough situation. 
to be fair, Favreau has a point. Here's what we did. We are shooting in Baltimore Ravens Stadium. The stadium is empty. It's the middle of summer. It's about 102 degrees. But what nobody tells you is that the aluminum seats reflect heat. So it's about 120 on the field. Sunscreen is not readily available. So I got second degree burns during the movie and we had to stop shooting. I couldn't shoot for like a week and a half while my skin healed. But you, it's a football movie and no one expe- you know, we're five months we were out there shooting. So you're kind of in shooting conditions, but it was, it was fun because Gene Hackman didn't care. <laughs> and so he had an umbrella set up. So after that, I got to sit under the umbrella with Gene Hackman for the rest of the movie. <laughs> So I spent four months of my life sitting next to Gene Hackman going, so when you were doing that movie, <laughs> like the most annoying fangirl you've ever seen in your life, I got all the questions for this fool. <laughs> I done looked stuff up. When you did The French Connection, I was curious in that scene when you run across the street, like he was like, I'm going to kill this little bug-eyed black boy right here. I'm going to choke the life out of this bug-eyed child. Every day he got a new question. So I had a ball because I sat with Hacky and I did that. And uh, I listened to Keanu do um, football chants. You know how quarterbacks will go, hut, one, two, hut, hut. So Keanu was trying to get the right rhythm in his head and he couldn't figure it out. (laughs) So just imagine, it's kind of like Bill and Ted's. He's got that voice going. But he's saying football stuff. Break 42 on two on two. Wait. Break 42 on two on two. No, no. Break 42 on two. No, no, no. (laughs) No, no. Hold on. Hold on, dude. I got it. I got it. Break 42 on two. Oh, dude, that's it. That's it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's shoot. Let's shoot, guys. <laughs> so that was it. And, you know, John Favreau's going, seriously? And Faze on Love is going, somebody overdubbed this boy. He don't sound like no damn quarterback. Who going to say this for real? Not him. He can't say this for real. <laughs> so I had a ball because it was a crazy cast of characters. And, you know, <laughs> it, was, it was really fun, man. But, you know, I, I tend to like to have a good time. I don't like to go nowhere to have a bad time. If I'm going to be here for five months, I'm going to bitch about it the whole time. <laughs> no, I can't take that. That's too much. Yes, sir. You had a question? Hi. Hi. Thank you very much. This your town? Uh, <laughs> Okay, I, you said it like, welcome to Toronto. Um, I own everything you see. I'm the mayor. My time. <laughs> I was just wondering, you're a comedic genius in my opinion. I love your stuff. That is very kind of you. Thank you. I'm just wondering what um, kind of advice you give to those who are up and coming and trying to get into the business comedy community. Advice to people who are up and coming who want to get into the business. Um... Look, I think the, one of the most exciting things about the time we live in is that you are no longer restricted to do what you want to do. Everybody has a device in their pocket, and it's connected to the Internet, and you can edit on your phone if you would like, but there should be no one that can stop you from telling your story, and nobody can tell your story better than you because you know it. So to me, if what you're doing is waiting on Hollywood or anyone, frankly, to acknowledge you, uh, I think that's not a good use of anyone's artistic ability. I, I think the best thing you can do is to post it. And you'll get an honest, sometimes dishonest, but you'll get a reaction. But like, but like anything else, that's the process, right? You, you stand up, get in front of people and tell jokes, and basketball players go to the park on the, and play basketball, and football players are always playing football, and some of them grow up to be professionals. So, you know, I think uh, the most power, empowering thing about the time we live in is that you guys have the ability to tell your story, and you do it through fan art and fan fiction, and you do it through sharing the parts of the story that you like and the parts of the story that you don't like, and you, you have a major voice in what we do. And so as long as that voice is there and vibrant and, and real, I think that, you know, we'll all be able to share stories with each other. But you don't need a network anymore. It's all on you now. Yes, sir. Hi, Orlando. Uh, I just wanted to know, uh, for the movie Drumline, um, what you did for your role, 
It, uh, funny you should say that. Yes, yes. It's a, I, I stole this from my friend's house in California. <laughs> I'm not even sure what it was. It just matched my pants at the time. <laughs> I was like, I need a hat. I'm wearing black pants. Oh, black hat. This is, oh, that's flat. Okay. Uh, so that's what I did. Um, Drumline. Uh, Drumline was an interesting film, uh, I think, because it was one of those movies that doesn't really have a plot. You know, he's like, he's on the band, he's off the band, he's on the band, he's off the band. <laughs> drum battle, drum battle. Uh, and, um, mm, one band, one sound. Um, and I think w- th- what resonated to me the, about the movie was this sort of idea of integrity and how we're all sort of held to our own standard and eventually you kind of have to deal with you. I really liked that theme in the movie. And... Uh, I also like the fact that there was a generational gap that I got to play somebody, you know, who's really from my dad's generation because my dad's generation hates hip hop and I'm like, <laughs> I'm all day hip hop. <laughs> so, um, Miles Davis used to do something really interesting when he played in front of his audience. He would often turn his back on his audience because he felt like they were celebrating his celebrity and not celebrating his artistry. And he found that that was very detrimental to him as an artist. So in turn, he would turn his back away and play his soul out. And people would watch his back as he played. Um, I thought Dr. Lee was a similar type of man who uh, really believed that this was the way music was done, this is the way it should be done, and he kind of closed his mind off. And this young person shows up and reminds him that um, there's a new way. You know, there's a different way, and his way is as valid as mine was. So that was often the battle I had with my parents, because I'm like, I want to go to Hollywood. And they're like, sit your bug ass butt down. You ain't going. I mean, but I understood what they were afraid of. You know what I mean? So that's what resonated to me about that role, and that's why I wanted to do it. And that's kind of what I tried to bring to it. Somebody who um, was uh, serious uh, and flawed, but ultimately learned from their own mistakes, I guess. I have a question for you. I wanted okay. to know about the haunting of Orlando Jones. Yes, what you want to know? What uh, can, what was your haunting? What was my haunting? Yeah, dude. Okay, so <laughs> we shooting Sleepy Hollow. We had mold in our house. We had to move out of the house. My parent, my my, my family left. So I come back to uh, to Wilmington where we shoot Sleepy Hollow, and they put me in a hotel. Nobody told me this hotel was haunted. That didn't come up at no point in the conversation. Nobody mentioned that they do ghost tours all the time. Nobody said that. So I land at 11.30 p.m. at night, and I check into the hotel at 12.30 a.m., And when I get upstairs with all of my luggage because I had to grab all the stuff from my mold house, I now unpack my suitcase and I keep seeing people run across the window like they're running from something and I go look out the door and there's nobody out there and I'm thinking wait I'm not drunk this is weird (laughs) so I take my stuff out to get ready to go to bed I see somebody run by the window again I go and look out again and now I'm thinking okay maybe there's a fire and then nobody yell that's why people are running by I'm not sure so I stand there at the doorway for a minute nothing go back inside I turn on the shower I get out of the shower my open suitcase is now closed the door is now open Suffice to say, somebody did not want me to be there. I don't know who that was, but I can tell you I left. So then they heard about the story. It was kind of, you know, people were talking about like how I got haunted out of this hotel in Wilmington. And then a psychic shows up and says, I got an idea. Can I take you back to the hotel? And tell you what was going on. I'm like, why the hell would I want to go back to the place? <laughs> they already made it clear they didn't want me there. I don't really know why I don't need to go back there. That's not really right. right. So I went with Kim back there for the haunting, and we discovered that apparently there was a convent right behind the place, and this was like some weird bedroom where they were doing weird stuff, and that that place had been haunted for a very long time. And the walking back and forth that I saw was apparently impressions of the men who paced back and forth outside. <laughs> waiting on whoever was in the room. She said all that. I can't confirm or deny whether it's true or not. 
All I can tell you is I was not going to sleep in that hotel room. <laughs> and so that just aired, I think, um, uh, a couple of weeks ago. So there's obviously been some chatter about it on the Internet and such. So. Can you tell me a little bit about The Devil in the Deep Blue Sea? Yes. Uh, Devil in the Deep Blue Sea is a film that I just did with uh, Jason Sudeikis and Mary Steenburgen uh, um, and Jessica Biel, uh, a guy named Richard Robichaud, who was actually nominated for an Oscar last year. Really incredible. Um, beautiful story, sort of about the magic of New Orleans and how a family uh, works through their issues. Uh, but, you know, light and funny, and I, I get to play a character named Dumbass. Oh, nice. <laughs> yes. Um, and uh, he loves the fact that his name is Dumbass. <laughs> so uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a fun one. I'm, I'm excited about it. I believe it's pronounced Dumas. Dumas. You're right. You're right. Oh. <laughs> yeah, the Quebec uh, pronunciation. <laughs> I went to McGill. I know my joint. I know my stuff. <laughs> Some more questions. Yes, ma'am, right here. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to how you experience like online fandom, like mm -hmm. you OTW and you've submitted yourself to our fandom is problematic. I sure. Know what your thoughts on how you interact with fans online? I try and interact honestly, mostly. Um, you know, we agree on some things, disagree on other things. Um, I mean, m mostly I just think it's, uh, you know, I... I I'm a fan, like that's how I got my job. I got my job being a fan, so I don't really think I'm any different than you. It's kind of like we're the, we're the same, really, right? So, um, and I just think it's weird that there's a barrier where I'm supposed to be special and you're supposed to be not special. I just, I'm not really, I'm not comfortable with that setup, but I never have been. So, I like interacting with fans, and you know, some people say crazy stuff, which is fun, and some people are nice, which is fun, and uh, you know, I just try and keep it keep it 100 as best I can, and and be me. You know what I mean? Um, and I hope that they do the same with me. Honestly, um, it's it's been a great experience because a lot of people here, you know, I I know from like Twitter or Tumblr, and that's I gotta tell you, that's it's amazing. Like, I don't think that I ever believed in my wildest dreams that there could be a fulfilling relationship with anybody based on social media, particularly a stranger. And I've had the exact opposite experience. So for me, it's, it's, really, it's really special. I mean, that's Dawn right there. <laughs> I see Dawn in my Twitter feed every day. <laughs> Literally, because Dawn's really funny and she says silly stuff all the time. And I'm the level of nerd that pays attention to the various different stuff. I mean, I recognize various of you, like, from the internet. Like, how weird is that? <laughs> but it's, it's pretty awesome, so I'm enjoying it. So, hold on. Let's, let's get the guy in the back here and then this lady here. All right, that works. All the way in the back. You, sir, uh, or the lady in the back. There. Yes, you, ma'am. Sorry. Um, since you were working for NBC, how's the agenda on Mad TV as opposed to Saturday Night Live? And also, when you became famous, did your family's reaction to you change? Oh, oh troublemaker! You're trying to get me shot in here. <laughs> See what's going on. Um, it's you know it's weird how the networks refer to themselves as families, but they're not exactly families just because they're corporations. So I was in the NBC family, but nobody was trying to put me on an NBC show. So. <laughs> I wound up <laughs> on a Fox show. It is weird. Um, my family's reaction is, well, for a long time, my uncles thought I was in the military. <laughs> That's not a lie. Because they say, oh, uh, you live out there in Hollywood. Yep, uh-huh. Uh, you, you, you a writer. Uh-huh. I don't see your name on nothing. Where your name be? You don't see that. Uh, so you in the Army? You in the Navy? What branch of the military are you in? <laughs> like, that was a real thing uh, in my life. I, 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 my mom... My mom don't play that. You know, my mom is very much, she is a southern black woman, you know what I'm saying? And that's, that's my heart. So my, my mother and I are extremely close. Like that's, but she don't play that. So my mom will cuss me out on a regular basis for fun. I'm not joking. This is no joke. joke. I got cussed out by my mama, and she thinks this is funny. I got cussed out by my mama three weeks ago because she says that the little boy from that show Everybody Hates Chris is her grandson and I won't tell her the truth. <laughs> Why won't you tell me the truth, Lando? I know that's my grandson. I know it is. He looked just like you. He looked just like you. 
You knew you went on that show. You had to do that show to spend some time with your boy. <laughs> Did you? Are you serious, Mom? You know it's true. Oh, you know it's true. She thinks that's funny. <laughs> she thinks that's funny. That's, that's what I'm dealing with. You, you can't be fancy in my household, okay? It's, it's, not, it's not possible. Yes, ma'am. Mm. Um, could you tell us a little bit about working on evolution? Um, sure. Um, Evolution, wow. Um, it was hot. Uh, we were in Arizona. We were in the middle of the desert. And we were right next to the Hoover Dam. So everything in the town was like the damn bar, the damn cleaners, you know, the damn tire place. It was like a one-joke town. And uh, we're in the middle of nowhere, and Sean William Scott is spastic. <laughs> Okay, Stifler is a spaz, I'm telling you right now. And Julianne Moore is hysterical. And David Duchovny uh, is literally got a whoopee cushion, so there's farting going on in the middle of the desert, and nobody can figure out where it's coming from. Because David's got multiple fart devices that he comes in early and plants them all over set. That's the level of practical choker the company is. So you're and then he likes to stone face it. It's like, um, just imagine David like acting like, what are you talking about? I didn't hear anything. Like with that innocent David face. So everybody, of course, thought I'm the nasty motherfucker. Of course, I'm the jokester. Um, it, it was a fun movie, I think, um, because we sort of all got to know each other a little bit, and that doesn't often happen. And and uh, you know, David and I just sort of hit it off. And uh, and then the fun part is that me and Sean became friends on that film, and we traveled through Europe together for three months when we were promoting it. So he and I literally rode motorcycles through Italy together, oh, wow. uh, and we met on that movie. So it was awesome because everywhere we. Went, Went, people just yelled stifler <laughs> but you gotta appreciate this this is the best part just imagine like a football fan who's yelling it like it's the end of you know, it, their, their life depends on it so all you would see all throughout all throughout Europe was this <laughs> stifler stifler <laughs> <laughs> and I'm dying. I'm like, Lay Stifler. Seriously, Lay Stifler? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, it was the best time ever. And the favorite moment of that was um, there's two interviews where it's not me. There's two Sean William Scott interviews where he talks about being obsessed with black women and motorcycles and lighting his farts on fire. <laughs> That was all me. <laughs> and then there's a bunch of interviews about how I, I, uh, I like chorus line and show tunes and don't appreciate any questions about my sexuality. <laughs> That's all him. <laughs> so we, we, we agreed to do interviews separate. So I was doing his American Pie interviews. <laughs> and he was doing my evolution interviews. <laughs> it was awesome. So that, that, was, uh, that was some of the madness that came out of that one. So good times. Good times. This lady right here. She asked your cuss. Are you cosmically linked? Like how that work? Well, the, the, thank you. Thank you. And I want to remind you all, there's always time for lubricant. Okay. <laughs> I wanted to know how you prepared for the role of Medea. How I prepared for the role of Medea. <laughs> so on the internet, I did a practical joke. It was April Fool's Day. I put out a post on the Huffington Post saying I was replacing Tyler Perry in the role of Medea. <laughs> Suffice to say, my mama and all her friends got so mad at me. <laughs> you can't be Medea. This is my mother. How can you be Medea? There's only one Medea. Why are you playing Medea? Oh, no, you just can't be Medea. <laughs> So I got cussed out about it, and, and, and nobody seemed to notice that I released that at 8.30 a.m. on April Fool's Day. 
15 days later, it was now a huge news story. <laughs> it was on CNN. It's on NBC. Everybody thinks I'm replacing Tyler Perry and Medea. Tyler Perry is literally posting pictures of him with Oprah like, look, it's me, Tyler Perry, with Oprah. Why are you talking about the dude from Everybody Hates Chris being Medea? Like, he's furious. So he finally puts out a statement on April 15th saying um, Orlando Jones is not Medea, and that is not funny. <laughs> And he's right. I'm not Medea, but that shit was funny. I don't know. I'm sorry. That's a good April Fool. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. Um, okay, so the first question. And what is your favorite horror trope? Whether it be in Supernatural or... What's my favorite? Horror, uh, horror trope? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Sleepy Hollow has to be. I mean, but hold on. Let me be clear. I'm a big Nicole Bahari, Tom Meissen fans. Like I, I work with them, and Lindy Greenwood. But like I, I really love my cast. I, I really do. So I kind of have to be like, Lindy Greenwood is from Toronto. Yes. Okay. She is also from the islands. I can get stabbed if I say the wrong thing up here. She might have family in the room. But I, look, I love Sleepy Hollow. Obviously, I'm a Supernatural fan. Have been for a long time. Um, uh, my friend Colin is on um, um, uh, Once Upon a Time. Um, so I, it, it's weird. Um, yeah. Uh, it's weird because, you know, when you work with people and you know people from different things and then you, you, know, you want to support them, you know, and you go and check it out and then you fall into it, become a fan. So it's kind of weird because I know people think like, oh, you can't be a fan of everything. And I'm like, it's, yeah, I kind of can <laughs> if, I, if I want to be, because different things are different things. Like, I don't, I don't want it all to be David Fincher, House of Cards, you kill a dog in the first five minutes. Like, that's awesome. But I don't need to see a dog die every day. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> like, I love House of Cards, but, like, I love Tatiana Maslany, and when I saw, um, you know, Clone Club, I was like, oh, my God, and, and I got excited about that, and, you know, I don't, I don't know why that's, that's weird, you know, but uh, I often get a lot of crap for stuff I like. <laughs> um, Sam or Dean? Hmm? Yes, Sam, Sam or Dean. Like Dean. I'm torn. <laughs> You're not being fair. Here's the thing. I, I love Sam, but Dean's kind of cute. You know what I'm saying? It, it's like Ginger and Marianne, like back in the day. You know what I mean? Like Ginger all sexy, but Marianne is cool. Like, you know what I mean? I could spend some time with Marianne. Like after a while, Ginger gonna be too ghetto fabulous. I can't deal with that. I can't. She got too much. She got too much. Um, Definitely Yeah, but you know, like I'm a DSTL shipper. Like I know people get mad about it, but you know, what I mean, it is what it is. I mean, that's what I like. And also, I like to ship things that are often underdogs. You know what I mean? I, I really, because I always feel like I, I feel like I'm the underdog. I'm a black kid from the deep south. Like how I wound up in Hollywood, like, I have no idea how my life turned out the way it did. Like, I'm, I'm super blessed, but I was, you know, you know, my dad's not famous, you know, I'm not from that. I'm from a really, you know, poor, to middle class family, you know what I mean? That's, so I, I take it really seriously because, you know, I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm blessed, you know, I'm, I'm like mad blessed. And so, Sam. <laughs> but I really like Dean. <laughs> Stop talking to me. You gonna get me in a fangirl dilemma up here? I'll be in the round robin for two hours. Uh, sorry, sorry. Oh, I do sorry. Like Mad TV. It was my favorite two seasons, or the first two seasons. Oh, that's. I got into it in high school, and that was like that was my staple every Saturday night. And then you left, and I don't know. Who it's, it's my fault. Seriously? <laughs> it ran for another fifteen years. How could it possibly be my fault? You were carrying the whole show. Yeah. Because you had some really awesome Look, monologues. Look. I, the primary reason really was I wanted to do something different. Okay. Um, I, you know, I, I've, if you look out through the course of my career, one of the things I really try hard to do is to not do the same thing. Like I really, if I can, try and keep the audience guessing. Uh, you know, that's why it's Replacements of Evolution or Time Machine or Primeval or Chicago 8. Or Ma it's like I really like to mix it. And a lot of times once I've done one thing, I just I want to go do something else. And, and Mad was like a lot of fun, but I really wanted to try my hand at features. And I felt like if I stayed there and I wanted to do features as a dramatic actor and I was on a sketch comedy show. You see my dilemma, right? <laughs> 
and there there and and nobody had done that like it wasn't like anybody from Saturday Night Live or Kids in the Hall or anybody had sort of left the sketch comedy show and and become a dramatic actor and you know and I managed to be able to do that with Liberty Heights and Magnolia and those films and that meant that I kind of needed to stop and go back to square one and start all over again and you know and I I, I was willing to do that because it, it was a chance to do what I love which is you know make characters that's what I love to do and tell stories I love that I love it I'm doing stand up actually tomorrow night at the comedy bar Nice. Um, I just randomly I mean I was here it was going to be a con and I thought I could go out and drink or I could like get up and have some fun and do a show and so uh huh well, okay, hold up. You see, you see all that attitude? Don't make out. Don't make Olandra pop out. You know. You know what? My inner white girl Olivia gonna pop out, and it's gonna be a whole other problem. All right. Um, it's the Comedy Bar is the place, uh, and it's in Toronto. It's about twenty thirty minutes from here, uh, and uh, it uh, seven thirty eight o'clock is the show. Um, I, it's on my Twitter. I'll repost it again, so it's fresh in the feed. Um, but uh, Twitter, Instagram, whatever it's. Hmm? You got to keep that feed fresh, girl. You know what I'm talking about. She understand me. She understand me. <laughs> what? <laughs> so anyway, hold on. I skipped over you. Were you? Were you done tonight? Oh, I think yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't want to cut you off. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just interrupt the show asking questions. <laughs> That's funny. But I had a question about your mama. Um, <laughs> you'll be the guy. You're the guy. Um, <laughs> I wanted to know, when you were doing uh, Mad TV, speaking of, you were um, housemates or roommates with Artie uh, Lang, right? Oh, wow. What was that like? <laughs> well, there was no cocaine, I will say that. There was absolutely no cocaine present. I don't know what Artie was talking about. There was lots of cocaine present. Um, Artie Lang is one of the funniest people I have ever met in my entire life. And he has a huge heart. Mm -hmm. And we had a great time while he was spiraling out of control. <laughs> we got kicked out of the Mirage in Vegas. <laughs> we got kicked off of planes. <laughs> oh, my goodness. We got arrested. Um, um, Artie went to the back of a grocery store, and he picked up fruit and threw it at the employees. <laughs> So just imagine going to the back of the Vons and you throwing apples and oranges at people and they're ducking. It was out of control. So, uh, and he tells all the stories in his book, Too Fat to Fish. Um, so uh, it was a fun one. It was a crazy time. I mean, um, I really wanted him to, you know, get better. You know what I mean? I, you know, I, uh, it's, it's never a good situation when you, you know, find your friend comatose on the floor from an attempted suicide and then you got to go get them to a hospital and then you got to go call their, his mom. I called his mom to tell her because nobody else wanted to. So for me, you know, that'll always be a, you know, a crazy time in my life. You know what I mean? And I'm, I'm just happy he's here, man. He's, he's a lovely dude. Yeah. yeah. I think we got time for one more question. Man, you had one before. Yeah. I just wanted to hear about some of your experiences on Sleepy Hollow. Okay. Um, <laughs> set a little haunted. Let's just be clear. <laughs> weird stuff happens on set. Like weird stuff. <laughs> like, first of all, Sleepy Hollow, particularly in season one, there was always a fog you know, hanging. So that's what it was like when you walked into set. There was like a fog that was always there. But something was always falling over. Or, and I'm not talking about like random. I'm talking about like this table falling over that way and nobody's in the room. Like nobody. And then they all go over and they look and they're like, oh, we don't know what happened. <laughs> Maybe it's haunted. And I don't do well with haunted. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't really do well with it. So I'm like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, for real. Like seriously, is this haunted for real? Um, and the problem often is we shoot at night. So you're always... You know, 2 a.m. in the morning, you're at work and acting like it's you know, daytime or we're out in the woods shooting because all that other stuff is at night. And now you just have the woods and the woods don't make normal sound. It's just weird stuff. And, and the trickster was Katya. Of all people, Katya is the practical joker. She is a nightmare on a night shoot. 
she scared me so bad. I'm, I'm be, I didn't piss myself. I want to be clear, but a few shots, uh, a few drops of pee shot out. That that happened. <laughs> She will torture you. She set up the headless, uh, fake headless in Tom's uh, trailer. So middle of the night, Tom gets back to his trailer, uses the bathroom, opens up the bathroom door, and headless falls out. <laughs> and Kati is in the next room, cackling, <laughs> cackling. And this is the best part. She was apparently on a call with one of her, with her mom or her sister in Sweden. So the first part of the conversation was all in Swedish. So Tom started freaking out because he thought it was a chant. <laughs> so all you get is, hey, let's, ah! and you hear, ah! clocking, ticking, clocking, ticking, clocking, talking, clicking, clocking, clocking, clicking, clocking, clocking. And, and Tom is like, what is going on over there? It was too good. It, we, we, got, we had a few fun ones like that. But Kati, uh, Katya is a troublemaker. It, it was Sleepy Hollow is one of the best times I've ever had. I have to say. I mean, I got to really sort of meet a lot of you, um, you know, through that experience and do like a crazy genre show. And and to be honest with you, I'll always be proud of it. It, it was the most multicultural show in network television history. And to see women represented that way, women of all color and also obviously women of color. Uh, was I think an important time and uh, I hope it happens again and I hope it happens again like that where it's not about race or anything it's just a fun ride um yeah, I mean, it, it was just a fun show with really great cast and really good people, and you know, I got to really connect with you guys on that as well. So, you know, I hope we keep seeing each other and stay in touch. Hit me up on social media. Don't make it weird. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you,